Hi, ladies and gents. Next up is Sophia George, who is a co-founder of Swallowtail Games, working as a designer and artist. Swallowtail Games is an independent game studio releasing BAFTA, BAFTA's One to Watch winning TikTok toys in 2013. Sophia is the VNA's first game designer in residence, where she will be researching and designing a game based on the British galleries and running public events. Please give a warm welcome to Sophia George. Um, hi everyone, um, my name's Sophia and today I'm going to be talking about my life in game making. Um, I was kind of asked to do this today um, because you don't get that many like young women in games, you don't really see that many young women in tech in the media, so I'm really happy to be here and just talk to you all about what I, what I do. So, um, I'm... Uh, I started a company last year called Swallowtail Games, where I'm the co-founder, but I also work as a um, designer and artist, because when you're in small studios, you kind of have to do a lot of different things. But um, I'm also the VNA's first game designer in residence, which starts um, next month, but I'll talk about that more in a bit. So I kind of want to talk about how I got into this industry, where I started. I I've always been interested in games since a really young age, and I've always known it's something that I wanted to do. So I was kind of, when I was in, you know, doing my A-levels, I was looking around at different courses, and one of my closest universities, Norwich University of the Arts, was actually doing a games art and design degree, so I started the course there. And um, if any of you are thinking about doing uh, games-related courses, it's important to take one that is creative skill set, uh, approved because that makes that means it's like a good course and it's going to give you good skills. So, so this course I did at um, Norwich University of the Arts or NUA um, was really good because it taught me traditional skills, so life drawing, colour and light theory, and um, two D animation. But it also taught me really important skills needed for the games industry if you want to be like an artist or designer. So things like 3D modeling, um, 3D animation, and how to use game engines. Um, we also learned a lot about um, how you would come up with a game concept, how you'd write a design document, and um, also really vital skills like pitching and doing presentations and all that kind of thing, as well as theory work so you can write your dissertations. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk about a couple of the projects I did because um, I'm kind of thinking about revisiting these in the future. So one of the designs I did was called Lady Danger. And um, what I wanted to do with this was take a kind of masculine uh, a genre of game, so like F uh, shooters, and um, put a really feminine spin on it. So I made this concept called Lady Danger, which was about a female spy. And all of the characters in the game were um, named after MAC lipsticks. and all of the like weapons and things were really feminine. I guess I kind of wanted to do this because all of my peers were doing like fantasy and sci-fi stuff, and I just wanted to do something different. In my, sec uh, in my third year, um, I did a game concept called Fear Meta, and as well as doing the design documents and the artwork and the animation, I also actually made a very, very basic game out of it, just like a, a, a platformer, basically. and. Um, it was really good to learn all these skills. I used uh, Unity 3D to make it. But um, even though it wasn't really a part of um, my course in games art and design programming, like I, I definitely wanted to do it. Um, towards the end of my uh, third and final year at Norwich University, I heard about this competition called Dare to be Digital, which is a student games competition which takes place at Abertay University in Dundee. And the kind of point of this competition is to make a game in just nine weeks and then show it to a load of people at like a big event. Um, about 70 universities applied for this and 15 teams got through to the final. So it was 15 teams working in a big room together in their little teams making a game in very like stressful circumstances because it, it had to be done no matter what. And the three winners of the Dare to be Digital competition were all nominated for a BAFTA Once to Watch Award. And um, 
So I got a team together. It was me, two of my friends, and two people from Abate University who I just kind of met online. And we, we entered this competition together, ha having some of us never met. And we uh, submitted a game concept called TikTok Toys. And we got through to the 15 teams, and we were also one of the three winners. But we also won the BAFTA Wants to Watch Award as well. And I'm kind of a very like, self-deprecating person, so I wasn't really expecting to win um, a BAFTA from my little game idea at all, but we managed to do it. I won the uh, BAFTA last year um, while I was actually still a student, because after I finished my course, I did the course a master's course at Abate University, which was where the uh, competition took place. And um, so winning BAFTA while I was still a student was uh, definitely, I was definitely the envy of my friends, but um, I was, because of this BAFTA when I really wanted to take the game forward. But um, anyway, I'll talk a bit more about the course at um, Abate. Um, this master's in game development, we basically had to make three games across the three semesters, as well as doing practical modules and exams and theory-based stuff. Um, so, in, so, for example, in the first semester, we would um, be in like a group of two or three, make a really simple game idea, and then in the second semester, the, the groups would get bigger and bigger. Um, but it was, quite, it was a very like, tough course. Like The practical modules themselves were very difficult. And, um, Working in the teams, you got to see how each discipline worked. So I was working as like an artist with a programmer and making sure everything worked. And it can be quite difficult with personality um, clashes because you don't know who you're going to be working with. Um, the game I made in second semester, Space World, was um, actually released this year just as a free download on the internet. And it got into a couple of really good... Um, on like well-known uh, PC uh, websites like Rock Paper Shotgun, and it was quite interesting that it caused a bit of a splash, even though we we just put it out without um, any press releases or anything. Um, this game was made in UDK in a, a small team of about like nine, perhaps. We collaborated with some of the um, other programming students on a different course, and. This game was subject to like weekly critiques by our lecturers. I'm just going to show you the trailer we released this year. In the deepest reaches of space, way, way out, well, there lived a whale. The space whale only ever wanted to fly through the cosmos, but space, as his friends knew him, was a hungry sort. Now, I'm told you should always start a story near the end. And by my watch, well, the universe has only got a few minutes left until it goes kaput. Perhaps if space, our cosmic hero, can feed and grow large enough, he can last the coming cosmic winter. Perhaps. So that game, we, we just kind of released it, and um, it was a really good exercise in just seeing how games do when you just put them out there. But it was, it was a free download, so we're quite happy with like the amount of press that it got. Um, in my last semester, we actually worked with um, Sony to create a game for the PlayStation Vita. And we, we were the first university to, to actually get a PlayStation Vita dev kit. And it was um, a really early dev kit, so it was quite difficult to use. But um, it was a really good experience, and it was really interesting having to do like Skype talks with uh, people that work there and to see what they think and kind of change based on their critiques. The game Epic Tale of Rock that we made was just a kind of a rhythm action game using the touchscreen. I don't, I'm not like allowed to show any videos of it, though, so sorry about that. But it was definitely a really good experience. So while that Masters were going on, we won the BAFTA for TikTok Toys, which was our uh, competition submission. And once that happened, we got like, a lot of interest from um, a few big publishers. But we ended up wanting to self-publish our game because I didn't think that a publisher would bring um, much to the game, to be honest. Um, 
so about seven days after I finished my master's degree, I founded my own company, Swallowtail Games, with a couple of people that um, were on the team with me, plus a few extra people. We got our funding from Mabate University's Prototype Fund, and that allowed, allowed about three or four months of further development. So during those few months, we added a lot of new levels. I think we went from 15 levels to 135. We added more, um, more assets, more level themes, and just some overall polish. We also added some options for like in-app purchasing as well, because we wanted it to be a free download. Um, the reason we wanted it to be a free download, because if you go on the App Store, everything is either 69p or really cheap, and it's quite a lethal marketplace. But um, we ended up releasing the game uh, on the last day of February. And here's a trailer. So in this game, I don't know if you could tell from the trailer, it's a bit hard to see, but um, you basically have a little uh, yellow robot called TikTok, and he automatically tries to go along the dotted line to the frisbee at the end. But there's all toys in his way, and you just have they've all got their own specific mechanics, so you have to tap or swipe them to, to clear the way for him. The game's kind of age range is families and children around five to nine years old. And we did a lot of playtesting uh, throughout the year or so that we worked on it, and we were quite pleased with how it turned out. So we submitted it to the App Store at the beginning of the year, and we were quite shocked to actually get featured on the App Store as well. And what I mean by featured is they put a big banner of our game across iTunes, as you can see there, um, with our logo on it, and they also put us into the new and noteworthy section. And um, this is kind of like remarkable for a first game by some graduates. Um, this helped us get 100,000 downloads in its first week, which they were free downloads. But um, I think we're on about 300,000 downloads now. And um, it was quite tricky because we had no money for advertising at all. So we really, really had to just email whoever we knew and like begged for coverage and all that kind of thing. It was quite interesting because there was a lot of game websites that I really like, and when I wrote to them, they, were, they said that they really like our game, but it doesn't fall into the target audience that they like. So that's kind of something I'm keeping in mind for our next game idea. I think um, if I was going to give any advice about like, you know, emailing the press, it would be to... Um, to take your game, but have a kind of story angle on it. So I kind of went forward and said that, oh, I'm, I'm a female and I run this company and I've just released the game, because you don't really see that many women run their own games companies. So it was quite interesting because not a lot of game websites took that on, but a lot of like tech websites took on, a lot of like women in business websites really liked it as well. And I even got to go on, um, like BBC Radio in Scotland and the BBC Tech page as well. So it was a really interesting experience to see how it kind of grew and the, how the promotion kind of just happened. Since I, um, through our interviews, I've always been asked about it, I just want to quickly talk about the whole like women in games like situation because at the moment the amount of women in games in the UK is very low, like lower than the usual tech average. And um, most of the women who are in games aren't actually creating them. They are in like the business management and human resources and marketing and that kind of thing. And I think this is a problem for a few reasons. Um, I won't go into about it too much because Lucy from Lady Geek is on next and 
that's the whole thing is trying to get more um, women into technology. But um, I think that with so little women in games, we're not really hearing like their creative voices, and we're not hearing like their we're not seeing like their art and see what kind of games they come up with. And I often see with some like really mainstream games, there's like really poor representations of women being you know over sexualized. I mean, I'm fine with like women being sexy in games, but if they if that's all they are and they don't have you know any character, then that's definitely a problem. So, like the ways I think we can kind of change this is to encourage like younger girls to get into technology and into games, and also treat the women who are trying to get into games at the moment a lot better. Because I, I know a lot of like graduates who who just can't seem to get their foot in the door. So my next role is um, the I'm going to be the first game designer in resident at the V&A Museum. Um, this starts on October 1st, and this whole thing came about through a collaboration between the V&A, Abertay University, UKIE, and there's also the V&A at Dundee, which is a kind of new museum that's I think it's going to be opening in 2016. I don't know if a lot of people know about it, but I've seen all the plans and everything for it, and it really looks amazing. Um, for this residency, I'm going to be based in London for a six-month period where I'll be doing all kinds of activities, and then I will go back up to Scotland for a month to work on a game. So the game that I have to design has to be based on the British 1500 to 1900 galleries. Now, this is a really huge time period, and there are so many different art movements, and even though it's the British uh, galleries, there's so many different countries, art and design in there. So I really have like endless possibilities for concepts and ideas, and I'm definitely going to be spoilt for choice when I, when I go there. When I went for my interview for the, v for the residency, I had to give a presentation and then have an interview. And they asked me what kind of things I would like to do with the design idea. And I said that at the moment when you go into museums, you just kind of see like the objects or the textiles just through glass. But a game would allow you to see all the items in the context that they were in. And it would allow you to walk through the environments you know, and look at the objects rather than just see it for a, you know, like a glass pane or something. Another really big part of my residency will be running uh, workshops. So I'm really keen to run game design workshops because I don't think people know an awful lot about it. I also want to run character design workshops for children to kind of get them thinking creatively and innovatively. Um, I'm going to be running some game jams. If you don't know what a game jam is, it's basically when a, a load of people come together and make a game based on a theme in a quite a short space of time. So it'd be really cool to get a load of people to make a game based on a specific section of the V&A galleries. Um, also things like Q&A session, talks that I'd like to run. And um, uh, last week, or two weeks ago, there was a uh, Friday late and it was all themed on Minecraft, and there was all Minecraft artworks and all that kind of thing there. It'd be really interesting to do another games theme for Friday Lake, because I think it, the Minecraft one was really successful. But um, e every uh, couple of weeks or so, I'm actually going to have my uh, workspace open for the public to come in. So this is really exciting for me, because people can just drop in and see what I'm doing. They can give me feedback. They can play test my prototypes that I've made. And I'm just really excited to involve the public with this game because at the end of the day, they're going to be the people playing it. When I, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm only 23 and I graduated last year, but I've already thought a lot about what I want to do next. Um, TikTok Toys was a really great project. It kind of spanned a couple of years because I made it during um, university. But um, it, it taught me an awful lot about this industry and. It's made me meet a lot of people in the industry, and it's just given me a lot of different ideas. So I'm really looking forward to maybe working more with uh, schools and educational sectors, maybe make uh, educational games and apps. I really want to work with more museums and galleries. In um, New York at the moment, uh, there's the Museum of Modern Art, and they have recently put in loads of different games into their galleries, such as uh, Pac-Man and Minecraft. 
and it caused a huge stir and people were so offended that you know, Pac-Man could be in a museum, but I think it's a great thing and I really want to see more galleries do it. As well as that, I'm currently coming up, I'm in the really early stages of a new game, um, which is a game that my programmer really wanted to do and experiment with, but as well as that, I would really like to make short experimental games that are, that are, are completely free, but um, I may be more focused on personal experiences and um, rather than just be there for commercial gain. One of the things that I would really like to do is to encourage everyone to start making games because I think that um, it'd be really cool if people who don't make games or aren't games designers picked up some programs and started making games because I think we, it would result in some really in innovative and unique experiences. But at the moment, there are a few tools available um, for people who don't know how to code and have never made a game before to make something and be creative. So now I'm just going to briefly talk about the different things you can download to start making your own games. Um, first up is a program called Twine, which was actually not created as a game making tool, but a, a small community started using it, and now it's really causing a bit of a cultural shift in, in games. And um, so in this program, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure book style um, game making machine, and um, you don't need any programmers, um, programming skills to use it. And um, I think it's really good for people who maybe aren't wanting to make a big, you know, huge game, but are more interested in creative writing, so they can kind of make interactive stories and um, um, kind of make something that is quite personal. I mean, people kind of say that Twine games aren't really games, but they've won awards and they're starting to become really popular. Another program is um, called Scratch, which is actually created for young people, but um, and at the moment, I think some schools are actually starting to use it because they're starting to become more of a focus on computer science. But Scratch can be used to make games, stories, music, and some people make even things like science projects with it. A really good thing about Scratch is that there's lots of online support and there's lots of resources, and it's fairly easy to prototype a game quite quickly. What I really like about Scratch is that it's designed for for children, basically, and I kind of like the idea of like families coming together and making a game. Another program that I really like to use is called um, Game Salad, and in this program, you basically um, drag and drop the images and the behaviors onto the scene, and it just kind of happens like that. I think it's a really good introduction into how game creation works and how programming works because you've literally got little buttons that you drag from one side and drop to the next. So, you know, you can have the whole, if something happens, this sprite will do this. And it kind of eases you into how games work. A really good thing about Game Salad is you can create something on your computer and then link up your iPhone or iPad and then the game will be on there quite quickly. So it's a really good prototyping tool. Um, the final game that I'm going to be talking about is called Game Maker. It's probably the most um, complicated engine that I've shown you, but I think it's a really good tool. Um, there's a game called Hotline Miami, and this was made in Game Maker, and it's made a lot of money, and it's won a lot of awards, so I don't think that people should be writing Game Maker off. Although it's similar to um, Game Sad, where you can kind of drag and drop things onto the stage, um, there is also like a coding language which is quite easy to pick up, and with the code you can obviously create more um, interesting and advanced games. Um, game Maker is free, but um, you can pay to upgrade it to unlock um, more features and also export to mobile devices. So I hope you've like um, kind of seen these tools, and they're really easy to use. So I hope I've kind of encouraged you to make your own games. I I like, really like the idea of rather than games being something that you have to learn all this stuff for, you can just do it in your spare time as a hobby, almost like you would with, you know, maybe starting your own band or just painting in your spare time. 
So that's it from my talking, but I'd really like to have some questions, or if you're too shy for questions, you can tweet me or email me through my website. I think there might be a mic going around, but... Hello. Um, Hello. I just wanted to know, firstly, I've got a few questions here if no one else has, but how did you pick your team for Swallowtail when it came to that point when you were leaving? So the team that you surrounded yourself with initially, what was the criteria? That oh, to keep it? them around, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, some people, well, one of the other girl that I had, she, um, she went to work for Disney, so I kind of had to let her do that, because that's amazing. But um, everyone else, I kind of <laughs> kept on, sorry. Um, but some people went part-time instead. But we, all, we got really, even though some of us had never met, we got quite close towards the end of the competition, so it was quite easy to keep people on. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Oh. Hello again. You have another question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, why do you think that you got the support that you did from iTunes? You said you were pretty surprised from it, and obviously it being the first game, but now you've had time to think about it. What do you think it was? I don't know. Um, I released my game, um, which won a BAFTA award, on the week of the BAFTAs. So I kind of tried to time it so that they thought, oh, this won a BAFTA, and it's the BAFTAs this week, so why don't we feature this one? So I kind of tried to be clever about it. So it might have been that, but it could have been anything, really. Hi. Uh, Hello. In this sort of, it's a bizarre small world. Um, I live in Dundee, right next <laughs> to where the V&A is being built. Um, and one of the things that they're very, very fond of in Dundee, as you probably know, is basing the future of the economy on games development, at least as <laughs> yes. part of it. Um, and what I'm kind of interested to know is, is your perspective on how games development can be made as a central part of uh, a city or a country's economy. How can it play a real major role? Well, I think um, Dundee is already starting to do that. Um, in Dundee, there's already a really big hub of um, different developers. So they obviously, you know, like G uh, GTA started out there and uh, Lemmings was first made in Dundee. And I think because of that, oh, there's also Real Time Worlds was a huge company there that went bust. And um, so all the employees from there all started their own studios. I don't know if it can be like a really huge, like sustaining uh, sector, but I think if they put the right resources in there, it, it could be. Mm. I saw that you uh, had a great. Uh, a Sorry, excuse me, I'll start again. Um, I saw that uh, you, the numbers of uh, women in games is much, much lower than uh, the rest of the IT industry. Uh, how do you propose in getting women more interested in becoming games developers and designers, especially the developer side, because there's a real paucity of women in, I in IT at that level anyway? Yeah, um, it's quite a tricky thing. With games in particular, about half of all like game players or gamers are women, but like none of them are going into the industry. And like that's really weird and like something horrible must be happening for that to happen. So I think it's definitely like a cultural and society thing. And I think one of the ways we can do it is to kind of encourage really young girls to think about coding and think about a games design. Um, but one of like the scary facts is that about 10 years ago, the number of women in games was a lot higher than it is now. So um, I don't know what's happened to make it go down so much, because you'd assume that it just is on the rise all the time. But I, um, I, I just think it's worth starting with um, young girls. But Lucy from Lady Geek is on next, and sh she knows all kinds of things about that. Hi, uh, I enjoyed your talk. Um, Thank you. 
I was just wondering, um, so obviously the games you've talked about have all been like sort of big project games. They have to have a target audience. They've been done as part of a team, things like that. Um, I was wondering if you have any projects that you've done or that you intend to do that are more sort of just things that you know that you'd like that won't necessarily have a huge target audience. Yes, um, I'm currently working on two projects which are things that I'm making on just by myself because I knew if I talked to my programmer about them he'd be like, no way. So they're all very like feminine games which like would have no probably no place in the market at all but I'm just going to make it and release it just because well I like making games so that's that's what I do uh, hi uh, so you said that uh, the game you made the uh, tic tac toy or tic -tac was toys. The yeah uh, it was made in unreal Unity? Yeah, oh, Unity, okay. Yeah. So this is what you make game in, like all the games, all the studio of yours is working and making games in Unity. Yeah. So this is not just for uh, iPhones and iOS, so it's already for other platforms. Well, with TikTok Toys, it is just on like touch devices because um, when we tried to play it on like with a mouse and a PC, it it just didn't work. Like I would love it to be on other platforms, but it was it just didn't work, and I didn't like it, so I said no. <laughs> but in future, I'd really like to ha be, have my games like on every platform that I can. <laughs> what made you develop for iOS instead of Android? Um, because I had an iPad, I suppose. <laughs> but um, I, when I first came up with the idea in 2011, like the iPad 2 had only just come out. So I was like, I wanted to, because when we were marked for the competition, it had to be based on like marketability, use of technology, and something else, which I can't remember. But um, I kind of, it was kind of like the, big thing at the moment because I thought when the first iPad came out everyone kind of like mocked it but then it went on to do really well and um, yeah we just kind of wanted to use it and I don't think there were that many amazing like uh, Android based tablets around when we first started looking at it but also it's a lot easier to work for um, work on iOS because you're only thinking about one screen size whereas with Android there's all kinds of different like formats for it. Hey, uh, could you recommend a source to learn from if you are unable to join the game design school? Uh, you mean like a book or? Yeah, or website, whatever. Um, well, the um, things I just mentioned, um, Game Salad and uh, things like Scratch and Game Maker, um, I would start with them if I was like new to game making because you don't need any like programming or coding and they all have um, really active like online forums. So that, I think that's like a really good starting point. And then you can maybe think about um, picking up a book on C Sharp or C++. That's what I would recommend. <laughs> Hi. I would like to ask the same question, but uh, like not a tool to use, but more like where to learn game design and stuff like that, not how to make the actual game. Do you mean um, Resources the, the actual to design? How to design game? Um, the first book that I bought, there's, there's an awful, you wouldn't imagine, but there's actually loads of books on game design and game theory. It's, you wouldn't imagine there's loads of people just writing about games, but there is. Um, I picked up a game called um, Rules of Play by Katie Salen, and um, that is a huge book, and it kind of, it look, the cover kind of looks like Mario. But it's a really good resource, and it kind of takes you through not only like computer games, but digital games and card games, and how they work and how they're very compelling. But um, I can give you the link later if you like. You can tweet it. <laughs> yeah, I will. Okay, thanks. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, I think that's everyone. So thank you for listening to me and asking questions.